So families, do you ever feel like yours has some issues, has some problems? There's things that need to be addressed, need to be fixed, not quite sure how you can move forward that you've already maybe resigned yourself to, um, I'm just gonna be stuck, I'm in a bad place, it's never gonna get better. Maybe that's because of all types of circumstances around you. Maybe you've been part of the problem or you're in the midst of the problems, but when family goes wrong, it affects our entire life. When our job is bad, we can usually, not that it's great to have a bad job, but we can leave there and go home, right? And we can go to a safe place usually, but when home is not a safe place, when home is in turmoil, when home is the place where things are bad, it affects our mental health, it affects us uh, physiologically, psychologically. I mean, it affects every aspect of our life. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look into over the next three weeks about what does God say about family? How can God restore family? If your family's been in a broken place, you don't have to be resigned. So that's just the way it's gonna be. Or maybe though you're someone that you say, hey, my family's pretty good. We're, we're making some great steps, but here's the thing that I know we all can get better, right? I know there's areas where I just look sometimes at my relationship with my daughter or my wife or my parents and my sister and her kids and I just go, hey, things could be better. So that's what we're gonna do is we're gonna dive in for God's plan in family. Welcome to church.
Nothing but the blood What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood Nothing but the blood Nothing can force in a tone Nothing but the blood Nothing but the blood Nothing good that I have done Nothing but the blood Oh, nothing but the blood And what can wash away my sin Nothing but the blood Nothing but the blood And what can make me whole again Nothing but the blood Welcome everybody from around the world, around the country, and around the state of Arizona. Thank you for being a part of the online service today. Starting a brand new series, so excited about it, Homefront. And becoming a father again in my 50s, we've adopted these two beautiful little girls. And actually it's now official, Ava is gonna be part of our family, uh, for our forever family, and we cannot wait. Uh, her adoption date's coming up in the next month and it's gonna be a blast to celebrate her coming into our family. But on a serious note, becoming a father again in my 50s has awakened me to the brokenness of family all around our world today, and especially in our culture here in America. So first thing I wanna share with you before we dive in, if you are in the state of Arizona and you have the opportunity to join us, we're gonna have a, a conference that's coming up called Creating a Healthy Family Conference. You don't want to miss this. It's gonna be Friday and Saturday, June 21st and 22nd. It'll be in our youth auditorium on our Glendale campus. So please, there's a QR code coming up on the screen right now. Scan that QR code, join us. Brian, Brian and Megan Bloom, amazing leaders at Pure Heart, they're gonna be leading that conference and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a lot of practical tools to help you with all the stuff we're wrestling with in our families. But today, we're going to start the family series by giving us a 10,000 foot view uh, from the New Testament of God's design for family. Now, singles, young adults hanging out with us, please stay tuned. Stay with me for this whole series because many of you want a family someday and actually many of you have been hurt because of a family, and I know you're gonna get something a lot out of these next couple of weeks. Families come in all shapes and sizes. We have single parents, um, we have two-parent families, we have some who are raising other people's kids, we have uh, families that, moms and dads that are raising their kids' kids, we have adoptive families, foster families, blended families. 
In all of this, there's two things that we actually have in common, all right? With all the diversity of family, two things we all have in common. First of all, we didn't get to pick our family, all right? You get to pick your friends, you know how the saying goes, but we didn't get to pick our family. And it's funny because when we were in middle school, we had a moment where we wanted to pick our friend's family because they didn't have the stupid rules that we did. They ate Pop-Tarts for dinner. They stayed up late and watched TV. There were no boundaries. And we wished that family could be our family. And now looking back on it, knowing how broken and jacked up that family was, you're like, I'm glad my parents had some boundaries for my life. Or maybe you were the fun family and you're like, I wish I would have had a little discipline in my life. The second thing we all have in common is this. Nobody in your family is as smart as you are, right? I mean, come on. You've looked at your family and you said, if everyone would just listen to me, they'd all be better off. Like, if you can have a family gathering and you wish you could get up at that family gathering, grab a microphone and say, hey, give me a couple of minutes. I'm going to straighten all of you out. You, you need to work on your hygiene. And you, you need to stop drinking so much. Everybody knows you have a drinking problem. It's not that solo cup. There's no Kool-Aid in there, okay? You need to quit talking behind everybody's back. You need to stop dieting on fam at family dinners and then binge eating at home. We all know it's not working. You need to go back to school. All three of you over there, you need to stop being victims. That's why you always sit together at the family dinners. You need to stop cheating. Everybody knows you're cheating. Oh, and by the way, you're mean, you're jealous, and Grandpa, here's a mint, don't kiss me without one. All right, that was a rant right there. And you're probably like, you need to settle down, Dan. You need healing from your family. No, we all know this. We, we all can look at other people's issues and go, man, if they would just listen to me. And then there's the brokenness of family. There's the divorce rate that's out of control fatherlessness and abandonment, addiction. Did you know that every 10 minutes, a baby in America is born addicted to drugs? Nicole and I are living out that situation right now with our two adopted beautiful girls. You have the suicide rate that's all time high. We have student dropout rates. Every 26 seconds, a teenager drops out of school. Um, we have 50% of people on the internet are watching pornography. Here's a painful one. One in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually abused in their families. Teenagers are watching social media. They're online nine hours a day. Eight to 12 year olds are online about six hours a day. Actually, our phones are raising our kids these days. Um, and it's not just a modern day problem. When you open the Bible, um, there's not a lot of great stories and great examples about family. It's in a real way, it's why I trust the Bible, because it shows the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's a real book with real problems, serving a real God. I, I trust the Bible. But if you think back to the first family with Adam and Eve, right out of the gate, God gives Adam and Eve like one rule, and they can't obey it. And then the, one of their sons kills the other son. Like the first murder recorded in the Bible, in history, was in a family. Um, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they all lie about their wives to save their own skin. Uh, Jacob's kids uh, sell their brother into slavery. And then King David's family reads like a, a reality TV show. Um, even Jesus' parents in the New Testament, they took him to the city. They, and there, there he is and he's hanging out in the temple. They leave. They leave their son, the Messiah, for a whole day. They're traveling for a day and they realize, oh my goodness, where's Jesus? And then if they take some three days to find Jesus, come on, they lost the Messiah. Keep your eye on the Messiah. But when we get to the New Testament, and I don't know how to actually explain this strong enough, but when Jesus and the writers of the New Testament start to talk about family, it seems a little bit ideal. It doesn't seem like reality of the brokenness that we see around us. But this is God's design all along for family. And I just want you to know as I dive into this today, there's going to be some opportunities for you to not like me much today. You're, you might want to treat me like a Kansas City chief kicker, okay? <laughs> you don't want to, you're going to want to maybe cancel me. So if you're going to light me up on social media or send me angry emails, just know a couple of things. First of all, Honestly, and I don't mean this too salty, but here's the bottom line truth. I'm not here to say what you believe, and I'm not here to say what you want to believe. I just want to share with you today what Jesus says, what God's Word says, what the Bible says about the design of family. And second, before you tune me out, just ask this question. Is the way our world is doing family today, is it working? Think about it. Maybe God, who created the universe, has a design as the designer on how families should function best. And thirdly, and I mean this one from the bottom of my heart, 
please don't use these messages as weapons against others or especially other churches. Please, please don't go online and say stuff like, no, our pastor's bringing the heat. Our pastor's talking about things other churches won't even talk about. I appreciate the fact that you're willing to show me encouragement and appreciation for standing for the truth, but please don't blast other churches. Please don't blast other Christians. Please don't blast people with the truth that we're gonna be talking about. I'm gonna encourage you with something. All of us, including me, focus on living out this truth for yourself not telling other people how to live out the truth. And then we'll actually be the light of the world rather than a blowtorch burning other people all around us. I just wanna challenge you with that as we get started today. Now you may think that what I'm about to read to you and what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through several passages of scripture from the New Testament. And you're gonna think maybe some of this is, you're gonna be like, man, this is old fashioned. But what you have to know today is that when this was originally written, it was radical. It was brand new and it pushed harder against first century culture than it actually pushes against 21st century culture. I know it's hard to believe. First century culture was actually more pagan than culture is today in America. I know some of you are like, no, it's not. Well, yes, it was. I don't have to get time to get in all the details of that, but just know this was brand new. This was radical. Some of you are like, oh, this seems so old fashioned. Well, maybe it's time to go back to some old fashioned roots of what God has to say about family, but we'll talk more about that as we go along. In the first century, Ladies, listen to me. In the first century, you had just a little bit more value than livestock. You had no rights. Um, you were considered property. Children, children, you had absolutely no value whatsoever. Not, not you know, children should be seen, not heard. They didn't want children to be seen. As a matter of fact, a lot of times they wouldn't name a child until they were knew the child was going to survive because the infant mortality rate was so high. And if they had a child that's character was bad, they would literally adopt a child with better character or more skill and then turn over all their inheritance to them. And then the New Testament comes along and elevates women and elevates children to a whole new level. Listen, every culture since, when the New Testament biblical worldview is embraced, women and children fare better. It's just truth, it's science, there's tons of social research that supports this. As a matter of fact, the New Testament writings opened the door for women and children like never before. The Apostle Paul talks about this. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 through 29, he writes, he says, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. This is so good. He's like, ladies, you may never get to be citizens of Rome, but you are now a citizen of the kingdom of God. And one more warning as we dive in. As our country moves farther and farther away from a New Testament worldview when it comes to family, especially these verses I'm gonna to read to you today, the groups that will suffer the most will be women and children. With the breakdown of sexuality, marriage, women and children will be the ones who suffer the most. So here we go. Um, we're gonna dive right in, and this is gonna be a lot of fun. So let's, let's get after this together. Let's start with marriage. Here we go. This is what Jesus says about marriage in Matthew chapter 19, verse three through nine. This is what he says about the permanence of marriage. He says this. So Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied. They record that from the beginning, God made them, watch this, male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. We're gonna get to that more later. And the two are united into one. And since they are no longer two, but they are one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Then, why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away? They asked. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession. It's only a concession to your hard hearts. But it was not that way. It was not what God had intended originally. It wasn't his plan. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. Now, they had a version in the first century of no-fault divorce that was next level. If a man wanted to divorce his wife, all he had to do was say three times, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and it was over. There was no court of law, there was no signing of a certificate, nothing. They were divorced. Now, if a woman wanted to divorce her husband, too bad, so sad, who's your dad? Okay, it was like they had no options whatsoever. 
And Jesus takes them back to the beginning. He says, I want to go back to my father's original design. He said, my father made you one in your marriage, and you're trying to unone the one. Stop doing that. And Jesus adds, if your wife abandons you, and he throws that in there. If your wife is unfaithful or she abandons you, and there's other parts of, in the New Testament that talk about moments where divorce is permissible, I don't want to get into all that. Here's what I want to say to you today. My story. Many of you know my story. You know that um, my first wife left with another man. So I've been through a divorce. I know the pain of divorce, but here's what I need you to know today. If my first wife would have been willing to stay with me and work through the affair that she had, I'm telling you today, I would have forgiven her. We would have stayed married because I knew that God was serious about his word. And I believe this, that he would heal our marriage and he would make us stronger than we were before. It's kind of like a broken bone. I've used this illustration many times. If I break this finger, if I allow that finger to set and to heal, it'll be stronger where it broke than on any other part of the surface of that bone. Now, I'm not saying that if you're in an abusive marriage that you should stay, please. There's so many different caveats to this, okay? Here's what I'm saying. We way too flippantly give up on marriage today. And Jesus says that marriage is a covenant. It's a binding agreement. And I, and I know there's so many people who look down on marriage. And, and I've heard this said, like, you know, Pastor, I don't need a piece of paper to tell someone I love them. You're right. You, you don't need a piece of paper to do that. But you've misunderstood what marriage is actually all about. You've actually misunderstood what a wedding is for. A wedding is not a declaration only of present love. It's a covenant commitment and a promise of future love. When the honeymoon is over and the new wears off and you're on each other's nerves and he leaves things on the floor and you feel like she's nagging you all the time, it's in those moments that God is saying, and, and much more serious things than that, it's in that moment that you made a promise for better or worse in sickness and health to be together. Listen to the wedding vows. It, it, the wedding vows are not just about how you feel right now. It's a promise of future love, no matter the circumstances. See, love is not just a feeling. Love is a commitment. And I'm convinced that one of the greatest reasons that God made husbands and wives so different, in case you didn't notice that, <laughs> we're really different, men and women are really different, is to teach us how to love at a whole new level. Yeah, we have differences and we don't get along and we, we have friction in our relationship, but that's allowing us the opportunity to grow. Actually, not just love, all the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. We get to work all that out in marriage. Isn't that exciting? If you're watching with your spouse right now, just smile and go, isn't that so much fun? Remember, remember this, Jesus entered into a covenant with you and with me. The Bible sometimes describes us as the bride of Christ. I know, men, that doesn't sound real, real exciting to you, but what it's saying is that we've entered into the, a similar covenant relationship with God. Think about that for a second. Jesus entered into a covenant relationship with us. It's the worst marriage possible. You know why? Because we're always unfaithful. We're annoying. We ignore him for long periods of time. And then when our lives are crashing down around us, oh God, please help us. And yet God never gives up on us. He never leaves us. He never abandons us. And he loves us. Just a side note. Several years ago, my wife Nicole and I were in a heart crew in our small group and she was sharing with some people in the group. We were talking about marriage and talking about where we've grown the most in our marriages. And I'll just warn you of something. If you're looking to your spouse to complete you, to um, be your only source of love or your most important source of love rather than to God to fill that empty space in your life, your spouse will never measure up to that. I remember my wife at this heart crew, she, she told the group, she said, the greatest moment of growth in our marriage was this. When she no longer looked to me to be her ultimate source of happiness, but for Jesus to be her ultimate source of happiness. Now, I gotta be honest, in the group that night, it kinda hurt my feelings. I was like, wait a minute, what are you talking about? And, but when she got done explaining it, I was like, that was probably one of the best decisions my wife ever made, especially for our marriage. Because what she was saying is, I know my husband loves me, but he will never love me perfectly. Only Jesus can do that. He's my source of hope. He is the source of my life, not my husband. And when she did that, when she made that decision to draw from God something I could not give her, it took a weight off of our marriage. It took the pressure off of our marriage, and we could love each other better. And I think that's a word for someone, some couples listening today. 
You're expecting so much from one another and God's saying, you need to come to me for that. All right, take that pressure off of your spouse to be everything to you so that they could, so you can have a good marriage because you have a great relationship with me. Now, moving on, more fun. Gets, gets more fun than this. Let's talk about children for a second. Um, Ephesians chapter six, verses one through two. Um, if you're under 20, check this out. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is right, the right thing to do. Honor, now watch this, it goes from obeying to honor. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. Now listen, obedience matters, okay? It matters when you're younger, but if you're married and you're still obeying your parents over your spouse, you're in big, big trouble. I recently had a great conversation with my son. He's 24 years old. He's been married now for about uh, coming up on two years. And we just had a great conversation. And, and he was worried. He, he was worried that he had disappointed me with a couple of decisions that he made. And so we, we walked through it. And I finally, I looked at him. And actually, Amanda, his wonderful wife, was sitting there with him. And I looked at him. I said, son, listen to me. And Amanda said, she goes, I know he's so worried about it. He's so worried that he's disappointed. I go, son, look at me. It's more important to me and more importantly to your marriage that you're more concerned about being in agreement with Ma Amanda on these decisions than with me. You need to leave and cleave, all right? I, I appreciate the fact that you want to honor me as your father, but more importantly than anything else, your wife now comes first. And I want you to understand that. I want you to be in agreement together. It doesn't matter what mom and I have to say. It matters what you guys with Jesus come to the conclusion with together. Now, honoring is different. It's different than childhood obedience. Honor is lifelong. Honor isn't rooted in how you feel about your parents. Paul doesn't say, if you admire and trust your parents or if they're honorable, then you should honor them. No, he just says, honor your father and mother. Let me give you five quick ways in which we can honor our parents. First of all, find symbols in your culture, in our culture and whatever the culture you live in that show honor. For example, for us, it's a big deal in our family. I wanna make sure that my dad has a seat at the head of the table or my father-in-law. Um, if my dad or my father-in-law are at a family dinner, <clears throat> most of the time, I want them to lead the family prayer. It's a way that I honor them. Um, remembering special days. If it's Mother's Day, Father's Day, Grandparents' Day, do something to honor them that's appropriate in your culture. That's one way you can show honor. Secondly, honor the good things they pass down to you. Recently, I wrote my mom a letter uh, listing all of the values that she has poured into my life. Not all of them, but the highlights. Actually, said, I wrote it that way. I said, Mom, I'm just share some highlights. It was a whole page of values that she's passed on to me. And she called me later that night and just, you know, a little bit of tears in her. And I could hear over the phone that she was crying. And she was just like, son, that's one of the best things you've ever written to me, the best things you've ever said to me. And what I did is I just took a moment to honor the good things. It's so easy to focus on the things that bother us about each other, but the good things that are passed on. Number three, don't keep your parents in a box. Let them grow. Let them change. Stop saying things like, mom always, or dad always. Stop that. Families get into these rhythms of sarcasm, and we actually keep each other in boxes. We keep each other stuck in our past behavior, and we don't let them grow up. We don't let parents evolve and mature and become stronger in their relationship with God and others. Number four, forgive them. Listen, if you stay bitter at your parents, your life will be distorted. It just will. I'm saying, we're gonna talk more about this next week when we talk about healing, but don't stay stuck in that place. If, if you're still mad at your parents as an adult, can I just be extra real with you? Then you're still a child. If you're still angry at your parents, if you haven't dealt with that, move through it, talk to somebody about God, help, forgiven, then you're stuck as a child. And God wants you to grow up, which brings us to our fifth thing. Want to honor your parents? Be liberated from them. In your own heart, say, you know what? I don't need mom and dad's approval anymore. I'm living my life for an audience of one. I'm living my life for God. If you're married, I honor one another. Because if you had good parents, you could spend the rest of your life trying to please them. And if you had bad parents, you could spend the rest of your life resenting them. Let's grow up. Let's move on. Let's, let's get stronger. All right, move on. Enough of that. The next three, anybody having fun yet? The next three are for husbands and wives. Colossians chapter three, verse 18. Let's start with the most important. You ready? 
Wives, submit to your husbands. I know you couldn't wait for it, could you? As is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Now, Paul's not done, so just, just relax. You know, some of you are thinking, but Paul, you don't know my husband. He, okay, he probably does. About, this is what he says next. Now your husbands, it's your turn. Okay, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Now, here's one more. This is so powerful. This is a powerful statement. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. This verse alone, as couples, if you memorize this, this can revolutionize your marriage. Okay? So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself. This is so radical for the first century. And the wife must respect her husband. Listen, we live in a culture that so disrespects men. You, you want to shut a man down? Keep belittling him. Just keep doing it. Just keep nagging, keep belittling, just keep doing that. Ladies, if you're tired of having a boy for a husband, stop treating him like you're his mother. It's the fastest way to help him grow up. Stop treating him like you're his mom. Let him become a man. Let him grow up. Let him become a leader. Let him face things. Stop trying to control the situations. I know I'm being really harsh right now, but men, here's what you have to understand. Paul says to love your wife as you love yourself. Why? Because in the first century, this was so radical. Men were harsh with the dog, the donkey, and their wife. Why? Because she had little more value than those animals. She was property to them. And Paul comes along and says, listen, you need to love your wife as you love your own body. Are you kidding me? That was so radical in the first century. And guess what? It's radical today because we can be so selfish as men. I know I can. I struggle with it. I'm a firstborn and a man. I struggle with selfishness at whole levels. And am I thinking about what's best for my wife first or am I looking out for my own needs first? Man, if we'll love our wives like we love ourselves, there's so many women out there who would say, you know what? I would respect a man that would love me like that. And yes, men, we've been given this authority, but authority means that we are a blessing, that we bring the best out of people around us. We don't lord it over people. Actually, Jesus called leaders to wash feet like a servant, a servant leadership attitude. Men, I'm telling you, we need to step up into our calling, and here's why. Because you matter. I know the culture says you don't matter, but you do matter. I, I've had the privilege of watching my mom and dad love each other, go through very difficult times. My mom, when I was um, probably about nine years old, she had an emotional breakdown, was actually um, hospitalized for a period of time for some brokenness that took place from her childhood. And I watched my dad never give up my mom and love her through it. And I watched my mom never give up on my dad. Um, and the interesting thing is um, my entire childhood I'm telling you, I don't remember a time when this didn't happen. Every time I, I wanted something or I wanted to do something, and I would go to my mom, and I'd say, Mom, can I do this, can I do that? My mom would always say to me, I want to see what Dad says first. Now, what you have to know about my mom and Dad is this. My mom graduated valedictorian of Phoenix College. My mom is brilliant. I mean, she absolutely has an amazing mind. She's brilliant. Um, she became a director of nursing. Um, she had about a hundred people that reported to her. Um, she passed all of her state boards. She passed all of her state um, surveys and the state would come out and survey her, her, her facilities that she served at. Flying colors. Um, she was offered jobs left and right. My mom was amazing. She's so brilliant. My dad um, owned a part-time landscaping business. He stocked shelves for a living in a grocery store. Um, he worked his butt off. He worked his rear end off to put my mom through college. My mom wasn't allowed to graduate from high school, so she went back to school um, at age 35, got her GED, and went through college, graduated, and then got this incredible job. And besides that, my mom, for a season of her life, made at least twice as much money as my dad. And here's what you have to understand. Even though my mom, in the work realm, and from an academic or academia side of life, was light years ahead of my dad in the ability to, with school, my dad struggled with school. But here's the thing, she respected her husband. She honored him. She let him lead in the home. Even though she was a leader in the workforce, at home, she let my dad lead. My mom's a strong woman. And now here's what you need to know about my mom and dad today. My mom has ALS. She's, without a miracle, she's super close to seeing Jesus face to face. And my dad daily lays his life down for my mom, literally. 
we've been so concerned lately. Like he's doing so much with lifting and different things. It's hurting him. And I kind of had a conversation, tried to confront him about it recently. This is what he said to me. She's my wife. <laughs> it is my role to love her and to care for her. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. I know this sounds so old-fashioned, but listen to me. If you looked at my parents' marriage after 55 years of marriage, I don't know anybody that wouldn't say, I want a marriage like that. I want someone to love me like that. But they lived out this passage in Ephesians so well. My dad loves my mom like his own body. And my mom has respected my dad. They didn't do it perfectly. But at a high level, she submitted to his leadership at home. And they have an amazing marriage. I know there's all kinds of arguments, all kinds of things you could say. I understand that. All I know is I've watched this verse lived out in my parents and I'm going to live this out in my life. That's how I'm going to love my wife. And I'm going to trust her to trust God to also bring that respect into our marriage for me. And she does. So listen, you guys, I know this sounds old fashioned, but take God at his word and see what he does in your marriage. All right, let's keep moving on. Men, we've got one more. It's so much fun. First Peter chapter three, verse seven. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding. Do you know how crazy that sounded in the first century? As you live together, she may be weaker than you. That's talking about physical, not mental. But she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers, watch this guys, will not be hindered. I mean, this was radical for the first century. Care about her feelings? Do you mean, what do you mean care about this, this woman that I didn't even choose that my parents bartered for me to have? That's what happened in the first century. I mean, I, I wanted her sister, but I ended up bartering for her. And he's like, no, no, no. You love her. You cherish her. You honor her. You treat her with understanding. You seek to know her. Why? So that your prayers won't be hindered. That is an intense statement. All right, now we're not done. We'll talk about fathers. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Here's another one, Colossians 3.21 for us dads. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. I know, culture says the main goal of parenting is to make children happy. But the Bible's clear, the main goal of parenting is to make children wise. Every parent wants a child that has wisdom, that makes good choices. This takes discipline. This takes training. Matter of fact, in the Hebrew language, the book of Proverbs, this idea of discipline means to coach or to train. Come on. We must teach our kids what is biblically right and wrong, or we'll allow culture, social media, and their phones to teach them. And it's crazy to hear our current cultural leaders say things like, we should allow our kids to determine their own identity. You know, it's like, are you kidding me right now? Come on. Now, ladies, I know this is going to sound a little tough, but you, if you think about it, you'll know it's true. Mom's words weigh about a thousand pounds. But dad's, your words weigh about 10,000 pounds. And I know this, I know this because almost every person I've ministered to who's dealing with addiction or mental health struggles or issues has a father's wound or a father wound, I should say. I, it's, it's interesting, even in my family, Nicole can say something to the kids and they'd be upset. If I say it, it's like, oh my God, I can't believe dad said that. It's just like the things I, like, a matter of fact, we were having a family gathering the other day and hanging out together and they were joking about our childhood growing up. And it was like, it was so amazing to me how the kids brought up all those moments in, in, my, in my past as a dad where I messed up, you know? With mom, it's like, no, nothing. With me, it's like, they remembered every little mess up. And there were a few of them, one, two, maybe three. 200, something like that. But dads, here's the bottom line. We can be absolutely right and say it in an absolutely wrong way. That's something I just want you to lock away in your brain today. Because we've all been in a work situation where the person in authority was right, but the way they came across belittled other people, talked down to them, and made them feel stupid. Dads, we have so much influence in our families, so much power. You matter. Now, in case you got lost in all that today, because there was a lot to cover and we're going to unpack more as we go along in this series, but here's a summary of what I talked about today. You ready? Marriage. One man, one woman for life. That's what the New Testament says. 
Husbands, love your wives as you love yourself and remain faithful. Honor and understand your wives. Wives, respect and submit to your husbands. That's it. Children, obey and honor your parents. Fathers, discipline, but don't aggravate your kids. All right, you got all that? Good luck. Have a good week. I'll see you next weekend. <laughs> no, we won't. We're not going to leave you stuck right there. I mean, you look at that list and you're like, Whew, that's going to be hard. Exactly. God's design is never meant to be easy. It's just meant to be a very clear path towards health, vitality, strength, whole, not broken families. And here's the tension. There's the design that God has for us, and then there's the reality that's been created in our world today. Because if you think about it, we've gone the opposite of most of what I've read today. And we have a choice today. We have a choice that we can either embrace God's design or we can pick up our feet and we can float with the culture. Or we can embrace the tension of God's design, knowing that we're going to fail, we're going to fall short. All of us fall short of the glory of God. And um, culture will think that we're old-fashioned, you know, we're just weird. Or we can keep doing what the culture is doing now and make the brokenness it's caused in our families the new normal. We can embrace the tension and the difficulty of following God's design, or we can embrace our culture's design and make the brokenness of our world just our new normal. I choose to stop the flow, stop moving the way of the culture, and go back to what God's Word has to say. And I want to challenge you today. Spend some time in these scriptures. Spend some time thinking and praying through this because it's not easy. I know it's hard, but remember, with Jesus, all things are possible. Doesn't, Jesus didn't say that all things would be perfect or easy. He says, I will make it possible for you to honor my word. He will. He's not going to give us a command and not give us the strength to live it out. So two things I want to do as we close and get ready for next weekend. First thing is this. You're hearing this today and you're like, wow, I've... I've got so much brokenness in my marriage. I've got so much brokenness with my kids. I, I grew up in a broken home. Maybe some young people listening today or some, even some adults are like, oh, my home was so broken growing up. Um, I wish I had parents that loved each other like your parents loved each other, Dan. Um, let me just stop right now and just pray for you. If you're in that spot right now, just, just, just pray this with me. Holy Spirit, I need your strength to heal. I need your strength to live out your design. I cannot do this in my own strength. Would you meet me right where I'm at? Would you give me the wisdom to know what's right? And then would you give me the courage and the grace and the strength to start moving forward as you've designed me to live? And then finally, there's some of you listening today and maybe for the first time in your life, you're ready to say yes to the leadership of Jesus in your life. It's the most important decision you'll ever make to come home to his love and his forgiveness and his strength and power for all of your circumstances in life. So if it's your first time decision, or maybe for some of you it's more of a rededication to Christ. If that's you today, just pray this with me right now. Pray this in your own heart. Just say this, Lord Jesus, in this moment, I commit my life to you. I trust you with my life. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. You know what it is. Thank you for your forgiveness, Lord. Fill me with your very presence. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And give me your strength. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Love you guys. I pray you have a strong week. It's going to get even more fun from here. Next weekend, we're going to actually talk about healing in our broken families. We'll see you next weekend. So in a minute, we're going to have a moment to reflect and think about some of the things you're maybe processing through based on this message. But first, I just want to let you know that if you're someone who you made the decision to join God's family today, or you said, I want to get back in tune in my relationship with God's family, and you rededicated your life or you committed it to God for the first time, we are so excited for you. What an amazing first step. Go to pureheart.org slash handraise so that we can walk together as family with you in that new relationship. A lot of times family, it can be hard. It can be challenging as we talked about in the beginning and Dan talked about when it goes right, it's amazing. But when it goes wrong, it's so painful. And let's not resign ourselves to this is the way it's gonna be. We're gonna take a little song. It's not a Christian song even, uh, but it's a song that I think reflects some of the things that can go wrong in family. And our hope and a desire as society and each person to go, I want it to be right. I don't want to be stuck in that place, but maybe I'm resigned to that's all there is. 
What I want you to take during this song as Pastor Brian sings it, uh, take a moment to reflect on what God was showing you in the midst of today's message. of my mother has my mother left in me and how much of my love will be insane to some degree and what about this feeling that I'm never good enough will it wash out in the water is it always in the blood and how much of my father am i destined to become will i dim the lights inside me just to satisfy someone will i let this woman kill me or do away with jealous love will it wash out in the water or is it always in the blood and i can't feel the love i want i can't feel the love i need but it's never gonna come the way I am Could I change it if I want it? Can I rise above the flood? Will it wash out in the water? Or is it always in the blood? How much like my brothers do my brothers want to be? Does a broken home become another broken family? Or will we be there for each other like nobody ever could? Will it wash out in the water or is it always in the blood? And I can't feel the love I want, I can't feel the love I need But it's never gonna come the way I am could I change it if I want it? Can I rise above the flood? Will it wash out in the water? Or is it always in the blood? And will it wash out in the water? Or is it always in the blood? I hope you were able to take some time to reflect and ponder and just pray and say, God, what do you want from me? God, is there hope for me? Because there is. One of our schools that we partnered with, Principal Tara Burnaby, that is one of her core values for these kids. As she came in as a principal, she said, I want these kids to have hope. And not just the kids, because she knows it takes the family. The family has to be able to uplift also. They want to bring these families out of challenging circumstances, bring these kids out of challenging circumstances, say, no, you don't have to stay stuck. You can have hope. Check out some of the things that they're doing to make that happen. Hey there, Pure Heart family. It's me, Principal Tara Burnaby here at Carol W. Smith Elementary School in Glendale, Arizona. We're standing in our infamous prize room that you all help stock for our students and parents. This prize room is an area where our students can come and spend their tickets on prizes and incentives that are linked to their behavior goals, academic goals, and their growth as people. Because of you, we took learning and made it something exciting for kids. It helped them be invested and desire to do better. They earn these tickets and then they come in here and they spend them every other Friday. Thank you so much for your generosity and helping make Smith the best school in Glendale. And I also want to just add for you, did you know that in this room too, you've stocked some incentives for our parents and families. So they too come here, they earn coyote bucks, and then twice a year they spend their coyote bucks in an auction. They're earning those bucks by volunteering here, taking parent classes, attending events with their children. And again, it's through your generosity that helps parents be incentivized even more than they already were to be here at their school involved with their kids. Thank you so much for everything you do to keep this incentive room running here at Smith School. Isn't it amazing what they're doing? I'm just so thankful for each and every one of you, your generosity that allows Pure Heart to lean in, do things like this for schools in our neighborhood, to help uplift communities that are struggling, to help see that kids and families don't have to stay stuck, that they can move forward and God has good 
things for them. We love you, Pure Heart family. Thank you so much for your continued support. And if today you want to give in that mission to Pure Heart, you can go to pureheart.org slash give, or you can text to give or in the Pure Heart app. So Pure Heart family, make sure you stick around for the next two weeks of this series, Homefront, because I believe God's going to do good things in your family. Even if you're in challenging circumstances, he wants to restore, he wants to renew, he wants to build up. And if you go, man, I'm already in a pretty good place. Imagine where he can take you. You're going to be. This series is going to be about healing, helping, and hope. Last week's message by Pastor Bob, an incredible message. I saw tears in the eyes of people in the congregation during the live service. You do not want to miss this. You can click the link below, or if you're not subscribed to our channel, go ahead and click the link to the side. We love you, Pure Heart family. We'll see you next week.